sometimes I, I scroll through Instagram or TikTok. And I'm like, we are living at like the pinnacle of human expression where everything is quote easy and looks amazing and sounds great. And yet I'm yeah. bored to death. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY Musician Podcast. What's up, y'all? Welcome to episode 339 of the DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Chris Robley, and joining me in a couple minutes will be Christina Cano. Today, we're going to talk about how to reach your fans beyond social media. So if you use social, like most people, you know it's kind of the dominant way that artists reach and engage with their audiences these days. But when you make a habit of it, it can also feel pretty cold and impersonal and inspiring, et cetera, et cetera. And so today I want to get Christina on here and we're going to list a whole bunch of alternative ways to communicate with audiences so that it feels conversational and real and deeper and more surprising and maybe most importantly, make you look like you give a damn about your audience. Because if you do give a damn, if you look like you give a damn, your audience will give a damn about you in return. And isn't that kind of the point of having a music career for all of us to give a damn together about the same thing? So uh, I'll get Christina on in a second. Before I do, just a few pieces of housekeeping. The first thing is that towards the end of this episode, we'll have a segment called The Hook, which is gonna be Rachel Berenger, our social media manager at CD Baby, coming on to talk us through one very clever, funny, super engaging piece of vertical video content that she found online and, and thought we could learn a lot from. So she'll be doing a case study with that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to remind you of is if you heard our last episode or if you've been on our DIY Musician blog recently, you know that the streaming platform Tidal has launched Tidal Artist Home, which is their artist dashboard. It's really simple to claim. And if you want details on how to do that, where to go to do that, and, and kind of what you can do for your music on Tidal, once you've claimed your dashboard, go to the DIY Musician blog at DIYMusician.com, or you can check out our last episode. Two more quick things. If you enjoy this podcast and if you have an extra couple minutes in your day, it would mean a lot to me if you leave a review, particularly in the Apple Podcasts app. That one thing has a huge impact on how people find podcasts. So again, if you have the time, thank you so much. Last thing I wanted to mention is I heard from so many of you when I asked what you thought of the listener calls and email section we have at the end of kind of a typical episode. And fairly unanimously, you all said about the same thing, which was, I love it, but keep it short. So I think that's probably what we'll do. Maybe we'll have one question per episode. If you have strong opinions about that, it's not too late to let me know. You can write me at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. Okay, that's the housekeeping. Let's get into the conversation with Christina. What's up? Hey, how are you today, Chris? I'm good. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you because I think you hate social media. (laughs) <laughs> you, hot take <laughs> you 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 came up with this episode idea so why that's that's the okay question. this this is a little peek behind the veil but chris and i you know brainstorm what are we going to talk about next week etc cetera, etc cetera. and he was like what about five ways to tap into your audience with social media and immediately my brain is like no <laughs> i don't <laughs> want to talk about social media i'm so sick of it um i use it you know we all do um, I'm trying to use it less. I am, first of all, a marketing specialist, and yet I have deleted, well, mostly deleted Twitter. I don't have it on my phone. I don't have um, Facebook anymore, really. I don't ha- use TikToks, uh, which I think is good for my brain. Um, and But I'm still somewhat addicted to Instagram, and I really don't want to be anymore. That's like the next big Band-Aid to rip off or like tr- thing that needs to get cut out of my life. But at the same time, you know, we all have to use these tools to reach our audiences, et cetera, et cetera. Or so we think. And I think I sort of wanted to reimagine a world in which we can still talk to our audience and talk to our fans without having to use these tools um, that maybe it's just like a little healthier and also harvests relationship a little bit better than these like mindless you know, not to say that you can't use social media strategically. And I, I've talked about this. You've talked about this a million times. Um, we've talked about this together a million times about how to do it so that it doesn't overwhelm you. But for those of us that just need a break from having to think about the feed or the grid or the real or the TikTok or what the content that we're creating and just think about like, well, how do we send information? Um, let's, let's rethink it. I like it. And I feel like there's three 
problems with social use with sort of average social usage that that I think you're kind of trying to avoid or, or yeah. address is one is like we've been trained to just throw it all out there so there's mm -hmm. just infinite stuff to wade through so nothing feels all that special uh we've also gotten this into this habit of like one-off posts right. so they're never part of a, like an ongoing conversation and then the last thing almost counters my first point, but the quality of content that you put in quotes is actually so good these days. Like there's so much good stuff that's shot well, mm -hmm. that, that's produced by really charismatic people who have interesting things to teach you or show you or some stunt guitar, whatever, you know, it's like there's no shortage of amazing, stupid human tricks applied to getting your attention mm -hmm. to hopefully get you to listen to music that, not only does it set a very high and stressful bar, I think, for musicians, but even the quality becomes part of the noise. Like, I'm not even, like, right. wowed by amazing things anymore, which is mm. sort of disturbing. I'm like, sometimes I, I scroll through Instagram or TikTok, I'm like, we are living at, like, the pinnacle of human expression where everything is, quote, easy and looks amazing and sounds great, and yet I'm yeah. bored to death. Oh my gosh, that is disturbing. It's disturbing that we have gotten bored by amazing things. The way that you place that is absolutely true. And, you know, also, I think that maybe even, I mean, everything has moved so quickly when it comes to social media. I think TikTok blowing up really changed the game. Obviously, it changed the way that we all sort of use social media. Um, and the mindless scrolling has become more prevalent for most people. I do think that you know, a few years ago, you could post a really well thought out like album release strategy and really get people's attention and get them excited. And now, and and maybe maybe even get them to click through and follow and pre-save and all those things. But I think that the steps outside of the this are like less utilized now um, through these social media platforms because we're like sort of in this like hypnotic state. And even if, like you say, there's wonderful content or there's wonderful like uh, marketing that somebody's using for their their album and they're saying, go click and, and listen to it, like it's much less likely now that I think that they're going to just go and do that. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to either incentivize them through all these things that, you know, we've all talked about for years or, or just re reanalyze the way that we're doing it. And yeah, I know I'm a curmudgeon when it comes to social media, I have been for the last few years. I used to speak about how to utilize social media like publicly. And I like it terrifies me now thinking about it because I'm like, everything that I knew even two years ago is like pretty much irrelevant now. It all moves so fast and my brain is tired. So well part of um when you mentioned this idea I was excited because, as I said, the bar for memorable content has gone way up, and we're even sick of great stuff. So mm -hmm. you have to do something surprising, <clears throat> and in a lot of ways, that's going to be a different medium beyond social or that maybe uses social in a slightly different way. So we came up with a huge list. Very um, long list. I love and, it. Yeah, and I just have like a couple sort of caveats. Um, as I said, so some of them will be will involve or overlap with social, but not about one-off posting in the feed. Um, some of them are obviously like online, even though they're not typical social media stuff. And then we've got like a good smattering of IRL mm -hmm. in real life stuff. Um, we've, I think we've struck a good balance between <laughs> even like- Even the way you say in real life has IRL. been affected <laughs> by social media. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. The vernacular, whatever, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and then I think the other thing we tried to balance is very practical, kind of direct message type stuff with more like wacky, fun, uh, just uh, kind of out of left field ways of communicating. And it's a long list, we're gonna go very rapid fire. And usually, whenever we do that, another caveat I want to make is like half these ideas will probably strike you, the listener, as stupid or boring. Mm -hmm. And some of them will be like, that's amazing, but I'll never do it. So if you walk away with like five things that you add to your list and you kind of either adopt or adapt for your own, you know, your own audience and the things you want to say, uh, I think this will be a, a fun episode. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. First section of this crazy list is things online that you are probably underutilizing. 
So these would be your email list, which you may have on Banzoogle or MailChimp or Drip or ConvertKit or whatever. Or an email. Yeah. Or ECC. Yeah. <laughs> email. Yeah. yeah. I mean, musicians generally have a problem underutilizing this anyways. Um, I do. Yeah, I do too. Uh, blanket messages to your entire list are one thing that we probably underutilize, but we definitely underutilize actually just writing to our fans either in a way that feels very personal or is literally personal, like a one-to-one -one message. I mean, if it's not an email, it's a text message. Send a message the day of your release. Let people know it's out there. I know all of us get a little like um, marketing hesitant when it comes to our personal direct community. We don't want to feel like we're smattering them every time we have a single, every time we have an album, but they're going to be grateful that you shared this with them. So if you're not tapping into them in any other ways. This is the quickest and easiest and most direct way. Send an email. Say, hey, John, it's been a long time since we've talked. I wrote the song. I think you might like it. Blah, blah, blah. Love you. How, how's your family? The end. You know, <laughs> like it doesn't yeah. have to be like a hello, friend, comma. <laughs> <laughs> hello, merge X, field one. XXX X, X, or a uh, friend in the colons that like, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm talking right. about? yeah, totally. Yeah, we got an email like that recently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right, to the podcast we did. The yeah. podcast, or someone uh, forgot to actually write the name of the podcast in the XXX section of their template email. So don't do that. That's the that, that's an on the no list. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned text, which is the next thing on my list. So if you have um, like a text messaging service like Community, you know, offer them exclusive stuff. Don't forget to use it. You're probably paying a boatload to have. And maintain a thing like that. So you might as well have some direct conversations with your audience that way too. Um, oh, go ahead. It's so funny how those things, uh, just that little tiny thing, like a text messaging service can make such a difference. I have a group of friends in LA that play a show every single week. They have like a residency and they send a Sunday text every Sunday. And I know that it's like a mass text, even though they've like figured out a way to make my name in there. But it feels so personal that I feel guilty every Sunday when I ignore it. So Ooh, that's effective. <laughs> it's very effective. I'm always like, oh, I should go because they're going to pay attention to the fact, but they, they don't, it's a, they don't know, you know, so those things are very, very effective. Uh, yeah. So then, um, a couple other options that are online, but that may go ignored is that YouTube has a whole bunch of communication, uh, features to communicate with your subscribers. Um, within your videos and your descriptions, you know, you can do end screens, cards, all those little things. I forget if they still have this, but there was a way to just literally message your subscribers. Mm -hmm. So check out all those YouTube things. And then I think there's also this thing that over the last 10, 15, 20 years, musicians have built these communities in different platforms that then we kind of ignore, like Bandcamp, Bandcamp. Bands in Town, SoundCloud, Reverb Nation, wherever they may exist. Like, you may have a smattering, 5, 10, 50, 100 people in these places that you have yeah. since ignored. But just even if you do it to make an effort to say like, hey, I know you're there. Come follow me wherever else I'm more active or like join my email list. Like, or just send them an occasional message. Well, if they're there, they're there. and They're going to get that message. I think uh, I use Bandcamp, so that one is... Every time there's a release, you know, it automatically sends them an email that lets them know, hey, Christina just put out a release. But if you send a personal one from your, you know, Bandcamp list or whatever, um, it feels personal. It feels like, oh, I'm speaking to my community that's on this platform. And so while, yes, it's somewhat social media, it is a built-in platform um, and not the harp on Bandcamp. I should probably get sponsored by them because I talk about them all the time, even though we work at CD Baby. But one of the things I do love about their platform is you can literally see who the followers are. Their icons show up. Their names show up. They can write reviews. So you can really build a community on these platforms and then cater to them. And know who they are. Are they most likely, you know, merch buying people because they've purchased something from you? Or they're most likely people that will download something because that's how they've become one of your followers or on SoundCloud, they're most likely streaming community. So really know who that community is and offer something to them directly that really makes them feel valued. Yeah. Well, the next one is in the wacky department, which is a fan hotline. You should set You're up. You're nuts for this. You're I love this idea. This. I love it. Uh, 
Yeah, set up a dedicated phone line or like an internet voicemail system. There's something called SpeakPipe that we've used at CD Baby. You know, you can create a, a Google number. Um, in fact, our podcast listener line was a Google number for a very long time. You can set that up to solicit fans to communicate with you, and then you can hear directly from them. You could incorporate their feedback or their stories into your content, into your music, whatever. The other way to do this, which is kind of my favorite thing, is when you present the content that the listener hears when they call you. And so like they might be giants did this. It's like a very famous thing they did, I think in the eighties where like there'd be what a song a day or something. And you called their listener line. Um, it was like on an answering machine. I think I forget the details, but there's this other one you can find. I think it's called call and oats where you call and you like, it, it gives you like the typical like Verizon, like press one for this, press two for man eater, press three for like private eyes or whatever. So you press the number and then it plays the song to you. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know how people can spin up their own listener line ideas, but I think the idea of this old medium of telephones mm -hmm. and the voicemail, I don't know. I just, mm -hmm. I love that whole thing. Yeah. Um, the next one that we were going to talk about was mail, like literally snail mail, um, setting up PO box or something for your fans to send you stuff. That's, that's always interesting. Who knows what they'll send you? Maybe it'll be something like their album, or maybe it'll be like a picture that they drew of you, or maybe it'll be like a lock of their hair. I don't know, but it's exciting. You don't never know what you're going to get. <laughs> During the pandemic, you know, I got really used to just writing letters to people and postcards to people. It was just a, something to pass the time, but B, it was a way to stay off the internet. So, um, yeah. Uh, on that point of postcards and Christmas cards and thank you cards, stuff that you can send them, um, you can do it by hand. Uh, there's also services where you can kind of digitize it and, yeah. and they will mail it out for you. you I mean, if you have like, you know, 500,000 fans, absolutely use those services. If you have mm -hmm. like 12, write them a letter, a personal letter. Yeah. You know, this is like, hey, John. John is our fan, by the way, in case you're wondering who John is. That's just going to be our blanket fan. Um, he goes by Johnny Two Shoes. He has two. <laughs> and <laughs> um, anyway. Tell me more. So Johnny Two Shoes. Hey, Johnny Two Shoes. Been thinking about you and your two shoes. Here's a, a link or something. Here's Here's an offer. Or did you know that? Oh, one thing I was thinking about. Sorry, I'm all over the place right now. Uh, the coffee is finally hitting. Do you remember when you would get a CD or record or a tape or whatever, you know, physical media? Um, there would be like a list of what was coming out next by mm -hmm. that artist or by that label. I mean, that could be a postcard you sent. Maybe yeah. you're, you don't want to use social media to let people know the next six singles that you have coming out. What if you sent a postcard that was like, here's what's coming up? That might be like a great way to just like get people engaged. It's very rare that people are going to get mail, you know, so. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, sending these to fans and things like if you have stickers laying around or, or whatever, yeah. you know, sending it to fans who are just on your list if you have their address points to the importance of having their physical address, first of all. But like that can be great. But I also try to make any merch purchase like feel like a care package. So like, okay, yes. you bought the CD. I've signed the CD. I put it in the envelope. That's the bare minimum of my bare like, minimum obligation to you, but I'm going to stuff it with like posters and stickers and whatever, you know, other stuff. And, uh, you talked about someone putting something on the fridge, I think, didn't you just a second ago? Did you say that? Uh, no, but that does remind me that I went to a friend's house recently and I saw the stickers that I had put in her vinyl care package you know, she bought a vinyl, so I put some stickers in there, and I saw that she had those on the fridge, and she had, like, even the, like, little, hey, thinking about you that I put in the vinyl thing on the fridge, and that stuff is really special to people. It They went out of their way to support you financially and emotionally by buying something from you. The bare minimum is delivering that product, but if you just want to go the extra mile, you're going to, like, get a fan for life because they're going to feel valued, and they're going to feel like that generosity that they offered you is reciprocated. So it really doesn't cost much to make stickers. It doesn't cost much to make a postcard, whatever. Throw that in there. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about with the fridge is like, it's cool to get uh, like a catalog and like, oh, these are your six upcoming releases. Mm -hmm. But someone's probably not going to put that on the fridge. But if you can think of like, 
oh, my concept album talks about whatever Middle Earth or something. You could make a map of Middle Ooh. Earth or like. And there's like six different places that they might go and they're all the yeah. singles. Right. Or you could make like a checklist or you could make an affirmation if you're like a new age artist, you know, yes. just something that is worth this person saving that may mm -hmm. not have um, the strongest connection, direct connection to your music, but it's worth putting on their fridge. Like. Yeah, I I was speaking to an artist recently who said that their cover art was all um, a tarot deck, and it was like they had created basically this like beautiful tarot deck cover art. And I was like, well, how about? And they said they were going to be releasing a lot of the songs as singles leading up to the album release. It was like six or something, which I always think is too many, but whatever. And I was like, well, what if you did each single was one of those images, and you like basically you know sold or like whoever bought the single they would get like one of those cards in the mail like the tarot deck card for that one single and if they collect it over time and they like prove that they got all six or they got all 12 or whatever then they get like a free download for the album or something oh, like that sweet. you know so you're creating a game mm -hmm. and i think gamifying um with something tangible can be a really fun way it's like the same thing as when they used to put toys in cereal boxes. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, no brainer. Now I'm going to go buy collect all 10 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one other thing uh, that's sort of tangible, real world related that you could print up, you'd mentioned show posters. Okay. I was walking down Melrose Ave yesterday on my way to improv class because I'm an adult and I saw teenagers in the wild <laughs> duct taping. <laughs> show posters to like light poles what it was such a win for my millennial heart i was so excited to see it you know it wasn't social media it wasn't screaming into the void on tiktok it was real life show posters and i was so excited and i i like gave them a thumbs up like the old lady that i am what a <laughs> what a heartwarming like life affirming instance of littering oh it's I'm so lovely. beautiful and i'll <laughs> <laughs> it's also like there's this thing about I don't know if anyone's been there, but a Melrose Ave in LA feels exactly like 1998. Nothing has changed. Um, it is absolutely the same. It's like the same sort of grimy, graffitied grunge scene that it was in the 90s. So to see these kids literally dressed like you know we were in the 90s, <laughs> doing what we did in the 90s, was like very cute and sweet. That's like the perfect segue into our next thing. The the next section I called mess with time. And what you're talking about is like a slice of time got frozen. They dress mm -hmm. the same. They're well, everything comes back, you know? Yeah. Well, so some of the ways I was thinking of playing with time is like a message in the message in the bottle sort of thing. Like send your fans somehow could be digital, could be in the real world, a message in a bottle or um, what's the equivalent of like a oh, time capsule when you bury something for your future self or for oh. future fans. Um, I'm not you, stoned enough for this conversation, <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> you, you, know, uh, you know what backmasking is when, when no. audio it's when like, Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like you could on the fan hotline or in your DM voice, you know, messages or in your music, leave backwards messages that someone has to work to like reverse and figure out yeah. what the hell you're saying. You could like the Beatles. Yes, yeah. exactly. Like all that dangerous music that was going to corrupt our souls. Um, Hail Satan. <laughs> I, I played a, at a venue last week that had a beer called Hail Baphomet, oh. which is like the goat demon Lord sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, enough cool. about Satan. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was thinking you could also leave messages from the future for your fans. Um, Expand. You're I, blowing my mind right now. <laughs> like, tell them about their life in 20 years. Say you've been there, you've seen them, they're still your favorite. Hey, John. What's up, Johnny? You Johnny actually have, two shoes. You have four shoes now. It's 20 and years you. later, you've got four shoes, and you've <laughs> listened to all six of my albums. Your favorite one was the one that comes out in 2027. <laughs> and you have listened to all 700 episodes of the DIY Musician Podcast. Yeah. Um, that one's sort of bananas, but um, I'm excited to see how one explores that option. Yeah. And then the last thing I had about time was uh, some kind of chronology. And that could be like an infographic that you share that 
is like maybe about your just your own musical journey and career, your catalog, whatever. Or if you really want to like take it up a few notches, make a personalized infographic for like your diehard fans that is specifically about when they met you or when you first remember having a conversation with them, when they joined your email list, like whatever it is, those different milestones, maybe they shared a post on Facebook and tagged you like show that you remember those things and that they're important to you and just list them out in a infographic chronology. Always, always say thank you. That one will like take you way longer than it should, of course, but like sure. most of the things on this list that are worth doing will because Again, it's about like showing you give a damn. What's our next merch? One? Merch. Make merch. your merch extra. Be extra. Cool merch. Tell me about that. Well, I think we forget that merch itself is a form of communication. Yeah. And so the degree to which it can be part of a conversation is great. Um, we said go the extra mile and turn a merch purchase into a care package, you know, stuff yes. the envelope with stuff. Um but also when you're playing gigs, I mean, this is something we'll probably talk about later, but like make it known that there's a reason to go to your merch table, that they're going to get will be there. And you, you will, will be, be there. at that merch table. You will be the one there. Not like some groupie, you. Maybe you'll have the groupie there to help like sell the stuff, but mm -hmm. you stand there and you shake people's hands and you sign the discs discs <laughs> you <laughs> you're the one that that is the face because that is the most meaningful connection i actually started writing um, a manifesto yesterday about why i hate the music industry and <laughs> chapter one was the I, and i don't by the way we'll get there we'll get to that eventually but chapter one was that we don't make these personal connections anymore we're not shaking hands we're not making eye contact we're not asking the fan about their life oh where did you come from you know oh i drove from alabama to see your show that is incredible have those relationships have those communications and then foster that relationship because Johnny Two Shoes, who drove all the way from Alabama, is likely, if you've like nourished that relationship with conversation, with whatever autographs he asks for, is likely to then drive to the next town that you're at, you know? And starting that that relationship now will have a lifelong fan. Yeah. Another thing about merch I really like to do is to basically use the merch itself as a gateway to like bonus content or to leave Easter eggs in the merch. So yeah. One thing you might know you can do is like, what do they call the, it's just called a tag, like on your shirt, this thing. Uh huh. So you can like put your custom logo on your tag, but you could just as easily use that to put the URL of a website that's unlisted that has all your unreleased demos or something. Uh, you could, if you use like Printful or something, um, it sends a receipt. You could have the message on the receipt include like some secret info so people find more stuff. So the merch itself, yeah, becomes kind of a golden ticket. Yeah, I like when the merch too is relevant to the release. Um, you know, if the release has a theme, make merch that's based on a theme. If it's about surfing, maybe you make a surf surfer's kit, you know, some mm. like wax and a hat and sunscreen or whatever and, and a download code. Always bring it back though to the music. I think one of the things that I see too often with people – um, when they're making, when they think about merch is they're thinking about the cool swag, like a shirt or a sweater, but they're not thinking about like, how does that connect back to the, the music that you're actually trying to promote here? So always bring it back to that, whether it's just throwing a download code on that piece that has nothing to do musically um, so that it does refer back to that. Cause ultimately you're trying to sell records, my friend. Yeah. Or streams or whatever. Well, one last merch thing. It I love this idea, although I also want to acknowledge it's the type of thing that most artists are probably reluctant to do until they have like a pretty sizable fan base, but you could set up a pop-up shop, like just be in some weird place. Maybe it's while you're busking or while you're on tour, you find unusual places to set up during the day and you like almost do it like a lemonade stand, like have sign autographs on, sell your t-shirts, have like one of a kind merch for that tour only. Just make it feel kind of gorilla and... I love that. Special and like it's going to go away in an hour. So people have to participate now. I kind of really love that. Maybe you're like a mid level local band and you play shows pretty frequently. Um, and you've got a little, you've got a sizable local 
fan base just to be like, hey, I'm going to be at so-and-so park at 3 p.m. I'm going to have a guitar. I'm going to play four songs and be selling one-of-a-kind merch for today only. Yeah. Come bring a sandwich. Come hang out. That I love that idea. Uh, that's great. Yeah, and not to bring it back to not that not that this needs to come back to feeding social in some way, but sometimes it's okay to do things even when you know hardly anyone will show up because yeah. it's it's a story, it's a moment. Yeah. The one or two fans who show up to hear this song in the park and buy something, you know, potentially will be psyched. But also, if you film some of it, that can be interesting. Social there you've got social media, and also, what else are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, what guess, else are you doing that day? Yeah, and if you're on tour. Yeah. You got a new town to do that in every day. I mean, it when you go on tour, you know, there can often be like the desire to do a radio program or something like that. But uh sometimes those aren't available, or sometimes, you know, obviously radio can be dwindling as well. Um, but let's try and keep it alive, everybody. But if you can't book something like that, absolutely this is a great way to say, and we even did this as a DIY musician recently where we were like, hey, everyone, we're going to be at this bar at 7 p.m. in Kansas City. Whoever can make it, show up. And, you know, there was a handful of people that sh showed up, but that's fine. That was and, exactly, what else were we going to do? We were going to we be at the bar anywhere. And we were part of that handful. We were part of that. <laughs> We were a significant part of that handful. <laughs> we were. All that to say. What else were we going to do? Right. And now we have an opportunity to just let people know where we're going to be to meet them, have conversations and network. Yeah. So the next thing is next level live gigs and live events. So uh, I guess I can list these and just interrupt me if you have a an idea. But first, just remember that gigs are maybe your most direct way of communicating. Your fans are right there in front of you. So you can you know, say whatever you want to them and and potentially they can say things back. Um, make sure you have that prompt to give people a reason to come to your merch booth. Make sure you know what it is in advance. Don't just be like, oh, so I've got merch and like, don't leave it to chance. Pre-script it. Uh, you could do meet and greets. That could be like before the gig. You can, I've known artists who have done like, hey, I'll come to your house. You know, I'm on tour. Uh, lucky winners or whatever my my closest fans i'll come to your house and make you dinner or like probably lunch if you're need to get to the venue but that can be a type of uh meet and greet you can do personalized shout outs to fans at gigs um oh i like that you can combine busking with a kind of pop-up sort of nature where like play on the back of like a flatbed truck or on the top of a mountain that you hiked or um i've gone to some secret show when i've known like you know, sort of notable middle level bands that are launching a tour. They'll do a secret show like mm -hmm. earlier in the day or maybe the night before their official mm -hmm. tour launches. You could do that. My favorite one was in an apple orchard. Oh, and it was like just a secret show. You know, a lot of times the secret shows too, it's because the band can't legally play like two shows within a, a specific amount of time in the same city. But they know like, oh, well, X amount of people aren't going to make it to this show. So let me just like throw an extra little event and i love those so well yeah it gives you a chance to see a band that's playing whatever thousand in an alternative or, venue in yeah any place um let's see we've also got um house shows but taking house shows to like a micro level where like maybe it's just a personal show for like one family or something like that you could also do as well, might like be Pedro the lion did that right like for one-on-one -on -one concert? Well, I don't know if he did one-on-one, -on -one, but he would like create very, very, I mean, he was sort of like the the king, I think, of um, creating personalized house show events. So he basically at one point said, I'm no longer doing venue shows, like period. I'm only going to be doing house shows. And then he would just like sort of create a mailing list and be like, hey, who in Tallahassee wants to sponsor this house show? And um, Johnny Two Shoes happens to live in Tallahassee now and he says, yeah, I'll do it and I'll invite 30 of my friends because that's how many people fit in my living room. And that, and then he did that for entire tours. And I think that's brilliant. Is that called, I think, uh, is that called Undertow? The organization that does that for him? I, I don't like know. I mean, I, I always just knew it as him, but who knows who the, yeah. Hmm. Um, one other thing I was thinking that might be sort of difficult to pull off, but surprising fans like showing up at their door and serenading them or something like the oh, custom. What are those called? E like not e-greetings. 
<laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Um, uh, it was like the singing telegram. Yeah, thing. singing telegrams. Yeah. I, I actually had a thought years ago that I wanted to start one in Portland when I lived there of just local indie bands. That would, yeah. Right? Wouldn't that be awesome? We're just like, oh, I'm going to hire, you know, Portugal demand. Like, (laughs) (laughs) well, and yeah, it's like almost like Christmas caroling too, like Mm -hmm. that that sort of thing. And speaking of that, like you could do tailor made serenades, like someone could pay you to write a song for their, you know, cameo, but IRL. Yeah. And then flash mobs, you know, like that's like the flash mobs that either include your fans or that surprise your fans. Um, mm. One thing I really always love doing is listening parties and particularly if they're like yes. more intimate, like at, at a house or at the studio where the record was made and it's a small group. Um, you could do them digitally. You could do it on zoom or on Twitter or something like that. But I think it's really special when you invite people that maybe had something to do with the record, but also a small community of people that you know are like your diehard fans. So you and you bring those diehard fans that you already know, like they have been to every single one of my shows. Um, they've already been supporting me. They are always sharing my stuff on social media. Let's honor them in some way too. I'm going to invite them into this really private thing. Um, that has been some of the most valuable experiences I've been to as a fan and and as an artist is having those communities fostered through listening parties. And you usually do that about like either the day before or maybe the week before the record comes out or the single or whatever. Yeah. I also went to one for a music video launch um, and it was super fun. Basically the artist uh, rented out or didn't even rent out. She just like had a, a friend that was a bartender. She happened to ask, Hey, would it be cool if at midnight I would drop a music video, I invite, 50 friends to come watch the music video and we, you know, put a projector up and I mean, the place was packed. It was like at midnight, that place was hopping. The bar was happy to have the business and we all got to watch a music video together. So every release should be an opportunity to throw an event. I am the events lady. I love events. um, And I think that they are the absolute best way to keep the spirit of performance alive if you're not going to be performing. So yeah. One other kind of event I was thinking about is like, you know, we're used to like in store, like music store performances mm-hmm. or radio station performances and interviews. But if you can combine those to host something for your fans, it's a little bit more unusual, like um, like a pub quiz uh, or like, do you remember the old like after the 11 o'clock news, there'd be the guy who like spins the, yeah, the, the bubble or whatever, the lottery thing. Like you could have a contest where the winner is chosen at this event or like you could use it as an opportunity to like to duet with a fan on the radio or at the music store. So like combining elements in that way, Uh, a couple other options, you could do a workshop or a masterclass and teach your audience something. Uh, Christine will hate this one, but like VR and metaverse gigs or metaverse masterclasses, any of this stuff in the virtual world it doesn't all have to be in person i do Um, that one but i get it i get it (laughs) uh last thing on this was pop-up recording booth so like if you've got a little you know focus right or universal audio uh portable thing you could go and create a pop-up oh uh, a a booth or, or yeah studio for your audience they can come in and like lay down a verse for your song or like they could you know, create a message for you that you incorporate into the audio of your next album or, uh, I or suppose a choir. Like a choir. you could ask like, Hey everyone, if you come to this show or if you come to this event or you, whatever you meet me in the park, I'm going to record all 50 of you for my next album as a choir. And, and then cool. you like, you know, conduct and you have this experience together and you create relationships that way. Yeah. And all of that could go for video as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think the last thing there is maybe it's not about them um, creating something for you to use, but maybe it's you're helping them create like a keepsake just for themselves. Mm -hmm. The other thing um, on that subject is anytime you film a music video, if you need extras, reach out to your, your fans, your audience. That's another way to get people engaged and to feel like they're a part of it with you. Um, And we keep saying these things that maybe sound a little broad, but really ultimately they're opportunities for you to create relationships with your fans that aren't just shouting out into the void and hoping somebody gives it a heart. You know, that can only go so far as far as a lifetime connection. And so these opportunities to just like meet 
in real life or or whatever, like th through the phone or through mail or whatever. These are tangible experiences that you can create engaging relationships and hopefully, you know, let it be reciprocated. Ask them questions about themselves. Get to know them. Don't just, they're not a metric. Yeah. Well, when you mentioned getting them involved as extras in your video, it reminded me of my friend Putnam about 10 years ago. He has a song about cast iron pans and he said, hey, friends and family and fans, like meet me on the at the East Promenade in Portland, Maine with your cast iron, bring a cast iron pan and we're going to shoot a video. So we had them all doing this sort of coordinated dance and it was great at work with the song. And then once the video's out right there, he has 50 people who are psyched to share it because they're all in it with him. So that's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. That's the other thing is that the more you get people involved, the more likely they are going to share that on social media. And so now you've created a chain reaction of a larger audience getting to see. So all those people that are coming, they all have a whole other network of people that have never heard of you, have never heard your song, have never heard your album, have never seen you play, but now they've endorsed you to their community and they're building a network for you. So the yeah. wider the net you cast, um, yeah, the what the more fish. Is that where I was going with that? I think so. That works. <laughs> It's a good fishing metaphor. All right. The next category we have is personalized conversations. And so this is coming from the standpoint where we mentioned one of the weaknesses of social is when you treat it like a uh, one-off post, one to many, where you post one thing and you hope thousands of people see it and like it, but a tiny percentage of them will. Um, so in response to that, these are things where you have way more one-to-one -one direct communication. Um, and they can exist on social like DMing people or mm -hmm. like leaving, a, you know, a video or an audio message in like Instagram, Snapchat. Is Marco Polo still a thing? I can't remember. Like the pool game? The <laughs> I know that's still game? a thing for sure. <laughs> no, there was a, a, there's a video app that kind of became big during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Anyways, you know, those sorts of things. Um, we mentioned shout outs to fans, but that also can include shouting them out. Um, in email newsletters and stuff. Then there's like direct messaging apps like Telegram and WhatsApp. You could do, um, in addition to your live streams that you might be doing, whether it's on Twitch or YouTube or whatever, you could do AMAs, which is like an ask me anything where- I love the whole, those. Yeah, the whole purpose of it is to be literally in real-time dialogue with your fans. Um, you could also, if it's more music-related, have them do an episode where it's like requests. It's all requests. So even- even though you're not having exactly a conversation, it's more conversational. There are like live audio channels, like in Discord, you can have an audio channel where anyone that's in your server just be like, hey, I'm going to go into the into the audio channel, let's talk. And then literally anyone who wants to hop over there can, can have a chat. Um, similar thing like on Twitter spaces, uh, there are online forums and community boards and music-related threads on all sorts of stuff, songwriting, production, genres and, and those can be on like reddit discord dedicated boards for that stuff um and then digital meet and greets on zoom or google hangouts and and really you can use those for teaching lessons doing uh ask me anything hangouts um i was thinking if you do that you should theme it it could be like coffee with chris and then i thought it's like oh Christina's usually talking about bathing, so it'd be tub time. And I'm like, tub oh, maybe, time with Tina. <laughs> maybe that's a horrible idea. Actually, there was somebody, um, before I put out my bathing record, somebody sent this to me, but like an artist did a live streaming from their bathtub, which was a thought I'd had years ago. I can't claim it, but we have all probably had thoughts like, what if we bring them into the most intimate parts of our lives? And that happens to be mine. <laughs> so I think that uh, those are really engaging opportunities to really bring people in. I mean, maybe don't bring them into the bathtub if you don't want to, but um, maybe take them on a walk. Take your fans on a walk or t take your fans on a digital beach hang or take your van, your uh, drive, you know, mm. maybe you go on a road trip on a very empty road and you just like take them for a drive and you have a conversation with them and please be safe, but it's an option. Um, if you do tub time with Tina, just make sure all the um, plugged in gear is... Uh... A yeah, that's why I never did tub time with Tina because I was like, I don't need this to be a live stream of my uh, of demise. <laughs> <laughs> um, two more things on this list. Uh, personalized birthday greetings uh, mm -hmm. that can be musical or not. But I've even heard of artists who know their fans' birthdays 
and set up an automated system where either by email or by like video ads served to them on Facebook or Instagram, they get their personalized birthday song on their birthday every single year. I'm like that, that, that's extra. The next thing I was thinking about is podcasts and they're great, but they're also a ton of work. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sort of said like, should you host one? Because there's the well-known phenomenon of pod fade where people start with the best of intentions. They get through like eight episodes. They're exhausted. They run out of things to say and then they disappear forever. But if you have like a topic or a real interest in communicating in that way, like I think podcast is one of the best ways to talk to your fans. If you don't want to host your own, you could just make an effort to be on other people's podcasts. A cool thing I saw yesterday also on Melrose was there was a pop-up, almost like a phone booth. I mean, I don't think most people can do this, but I thought it was cool. Maybe you don't need the phone booth, um, but it had a microphone set up and you just went in there and it was for a podcast. I forget which one. And basically it was a place for you to like a confessional booth to for their podcast. So I think it had prompts and it was like, tell us your most embarrassing story from the bar or tell us like a time that you got too loose to be able to whatever. And you got to like tell this confessional and then it got used on someone's podcast. And I thought that was a really clever way to get people interacted um, and then probably find out about this podcast for the first time ever. So maybe you don't have a phone booth that you can just put on a public street, but maybe it's as easy as going up to people and asking them questions like, uh, hey, I'm recording this podcast about music. Like, what's the favorite your favorite concert you've ever went to? And just create those relationships. Um, IRL. I can't stop saying it now. <laughs> yeah, you know that, that made me think of. I went and saw this comedian who was on tour. He came through our town, and um, he's really into science. So I, I'm forgetting his name now, but I'm sure some listener will know. His whole comedy act is about psychedelics, and. Um, but he's also really into science. And when he goes on tour, he every town he goes to, he goes to the university and talks to the science professors because he's like, A, they're all, they make themselves so available because no one wants to talk to them about anything. And then I show up. So he has a science podcast that he runs as this passion project as he's on the road. So maybe there's something there for touring artists. And maybe the topic of the podcast doesn't even have to be directly about music. All right. The next subject was user-generated content. So this could involve social, um, but basically respond to everything. <laughs> Somebody reaches out to you, respond to it. Create that connection. Say thanks. Even if it's just like you have that one emoji that you use every single time somebody <laughs> reaches out to you, that's fine. Respond. It like shows that you noticed it. And there is something, I think, mentally that when people see that they just assume oh wow maybe they care about me and it's the weirdest thing because you know even if it is just like out of habit or it is just like a marketing ploy there is something about like feeling seen that makes you more committed to the other person i mean that yeah. is just marketing but it's incredible how it works our brains are not that complicated uh, yeah and i would say <laughs> particularly to like user generated content if someone makes anything using your music whether it's a recording or they're doing a cover song of your song yeah. or whatever it's like it's not an option you have to comment on it yeah. like what a gift mm -hmm. uh there's also fan clubs and fan sites and if you have those you're very lucky um if you have those make sure you give the people who run those sites and clubs a lot of access a lot of perks um i'm gonna date myself but um speaking of fan sites when the internet became a thing <laughs> that everyone had in their house. I remember like chat rooms were really big. And one of the first ones I ever went to was the No Doubt fan club chat room. And it was just a website that was just a chat room. And that was really fun. Do you remember chat rooms? Oh, yeah. I think the, the <laughs> first website I ever went to in my entire life was, remember the band Corn. Yeah. Oh, K-O-R-N. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. their site, and I think I they went did to that site, site too. <laughs> had like awful, like pixelated flames or something. So bad. Um, well, let's see. A another part of user-generated content is obviously your fans need to know they can make it. So give them permission, give them a prompt, tell them they can use your music. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, TikTok is an incredible tool for that, for for letting people know that they can use your music, obviously. You know, it, it 
one thing that has happened is that a lot of our art has just become public commodity in a lot of ways. So anybody can just like duet with it or whatever, but maybe creating a more intentional space for it or saying like, Hey, I'm very specifically asking for this that will create that connection and fan meetups. Amazing way to just once again, connect with people, let them know, Hey, Thursday, 6 PM, this pub going to be there. Want to meet you. Yeah, one of my uh, favorite things when on tour is like you kind of run out of your own music that you want to hear so you can collaborate, make a collaborative uh, playlist on Spotify or YouTube or something and just get your fans to contribute to it. They can like literally just swap out songs, add new stuff for you every day. Kind of the same thing could happen with set lists. You could either like make this a contest where the winner gets to pick your entire set or you wow. just sort of poll them, get them to vote so that they choose your set list. That's trust. That is trust. I mean, I, I suppose the criteria would they have to pick from your own songs, but yeah, you have to know your own songs. <laughs> they pick like a song that you wrote eight years ago and uh -huh. you don't, you haven't played it in six. And then we mentioned the pop up store, but you could also do a pop up exhibit of your fans' stuff, their artwork, their music, mm -hmm. their family photo, whatever it is. Pay it forward. Uh, yeah. And you could set that up like in the, you know, the front room of the venue or something, or like a side room of the venue at every show on tour. So it becomes I love that idea. It's kind of combining the fan meetup with something that celebrates them. Wonderful. And then there's wacky stuff. This list is bananas. I'm just going <laughs> to go ahead and say, Chris Robley wrote this list. I love it. Go for it, Chris. <laughs> All right. First treasure hunts. Love it. You should geocache stuff, leave secret clues, and it could be for merch, ticket giveaways, weird photos, or just messages that slowly build some story. Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun to me. My th This next one cost what, you some money. What is this one? You know, when you're at the beach and the airplane flies by oh, dragging yeah. the sign. I saw one the other day. It just said Lana Del Rey. Didn't say anything else. It just said Lana Del Rey. Perfect. And also... On 420, I was at the beach, and there was a billboard that just said, or a plane that went by that just said, Dr. Dre, The Chronic. Of course. Of, of course. course they're trying to remind you to listen to that <laughs> on this day. Um, beautiful. That's awesome. And, like, I, I suppose for people who are like, I can't pull that off, like, you know, there's AI. Sure. You could invent some of this content. You don't need an actual airplane to fly your sign. Um. Although oh, it'd be pretty cool. You're saying that's cool. Uh, billboards, you know, put your face on a billboard, either or Photoshop in... your face onto a fake billboard. Exactly. Love it. Um, graffiti, you know, go and desecrate <laughs> someone else's private property with your message. I love how punk rock we're getting. Either in real life or in the digital realm. Uh, crop <laughs> circles. You should go to a farm in Nebraska and make a crop circle with your wow band logo and a message and some Easter egg. I mean, I guess the crop circle itself is kind of an Easter egg, but that is the bold and the beautiful idea. <laughs> uh, all right, here's the next one. This isn't wacky at all. You know how like when someone is in need or maybe they're about to have a baby or they're losing someone, there's like this church thing of like, we're going to give out candles and have a prayer time. Like we'll let you know at eight o'clock, everyone think good thoughts or, you know, it could be, more new agey it could be very religious mm -hmm. but like you should just do a seance or something oh, wow. with your fans all at the same time maybe all at home i don't know who you commune with maybe baphomet but mm. um something about your music messaging work it into a, a coordinated seance and then the last wacky idea I had is tattoos wow you could make <laughs> them you could design them and get your fans and you could have your fans design a tattoo that you I think have make to get. temporary tattoos too on the merch list. Temporary. I think Johnny Two Shoes would probably get a tattoo of your name on her, on his arm. Johnny Two Shoes tattoos. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Well, these are all really incredible options. I really like all of them. Crop Circle might be my favorite yeah, on the that's list. My but uh <laughs> In general, all of these, as wacky as they may be or as practical as they may be, they're just opportunities for you to create conversations, to feed relationships, and to build lifelong fans. Um, again, I can't harp on it enough. There's only so much that you can get out of the digital realm, I believe. Um, 
And I'm sure that there are a lot of music industry scholars and executives that would completely disagree with me and people that love AI, et cetera. But I do think that there is nothing that can replace in-person interaction or at least uh, real connection. So that's why we are having this conversation. Yeah. And I think just a couple points I want to make to close is like when you have a friendship, it's not, well, it sh- or at least it shouldn't be a message you leave for your friend's voicemail. And then like, that's it. That's like what social media kind of is when it's mm-hmm. one off post. So like you and your friend hopefully have many conversations over many years They keep shifting. So a way, you know, just think of ways in which you can keep your dialogue with fans open, iterative, ongoing, sort of sequential. Um, and that can also involve collaboration. So, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but any way that your fans can get involved in helping you shape your music, your promotion, your videos, whatever, because those are the things that are going to turn them from kind of casual fans to really like dedicated fans who are going to advocate for your music. I do want to get you to do a dedicated episode about like 10 tips to grow on Instagram or whatever. Sure, I can do that easy, but you know, this is more fun. It's more fun to think of outside the box um, or outside the grid or the, the black mirror or whatever it's called. Um, It's just like, it it gives me headaches now, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) Yes, I do. Well, speaking of Instagram and or TikTok, we have one bit of amazing vertical video content that we are going to have Rachel Berenger come on and tell us all about and do a case study of. It's wacky. I think you're going to like it. So let's get to the hook. Hey, y'all. It's uh, Rachel Berenger here with the very first edition of The Hook, Uh, the social media hook for our music. Just some uh, examination, microscopic examination of some cool uh, social media content. And today I want to tell you about a video from a musician named uh, Max Boonch, whose name I believe is a moniker. I don't think it's his uh, real name. but it's funny nonetheless, and I like it a lot. Uh, but he's a comedic songwriter and also from uh, his SoundCloud, apparently a filmmaker, which makes sense for the video editing elements of this. It's like not super, super involved, but it's a little uh, above average, I would say, on the video editing side of things. Um, but for the folks who are listening audio only, uh, this will be not quite the same experience. Uh, But basically, this video features a guy holding a pink acoustic guitar uh, and singing about YouTube thumbnails and how we might use that same um, art style for other forms of media. And so here's the video. We need to understand the art of a YouTube thumbnail, analyze them all, and I bet that we will start to sell a lot more books if we change the cover and replace it with the hook like thousand blind people see for the first time. I spent 50 hours buried alive, now that's a competition for Lord of the Flies. Told me Dick Twilight, Catcher in the Rye. Every album ever could be a clickbait, artists on the cover making this stupid face. Break up story time, plus I get my driver's license, I define the sound. Of an entire generation challenge. I think it works also for movies. Don't worry, darling, become Harry Styles. Sorry, in brackets. Apology video. I don't know what you, but that probably would have made me go. Textbook, street sign, tension span, decline, recipes, hairstyles, dating app profiles. We could use it for the news, but I guess they already do. So, what I really love about uh, this particular piece of content, but also just the way that Max approaches social media as a whole is that he's found a repeatable format that plays to his strengths of comedic songwriting and video editing. And he's found a way to make it very recognizable upon uh, showing up on your feed. And it's something that he can take this same format and continue to write these, you know, little ditties uh, and, and make, new videos about it each time. And, and, you know, they do really, really well uh, on TikTok and Instagram Reels. Uh, And I think that it's just something that we can sort of analyze and think about what's something that we could do from a social media standpoint um, to be repeatable, be serialized, uh, and make the social content stream a little bit more streamlined and 
uh, faster with all of it. And I think it also, you know, he's he's really good about making the social media thing, but he's also showcasing his songwriting chops and his production chops in some ways as well. And his music is really good as well. So just check it out. It's very nice. That was hilarious. And I love that it was, is it satire also about social media in a way? It is. And he's got, he's got some other videos too. And uh, it's, it's kind of a meta thing a little bit because I've been watching his stuff for a while and he has another song about brands taking place uh, or participating in the social media space and like trying to be relatable and trying to like (laughs) comment on uh, creators videos to kind of like take it as billboard advertising for something that's already popular. And then the brands being like, Oh my God, so true. And it's like, Oh, you're just kind of, uh, hacking the fact that you have a blue check uh, yeah. to be more visible on these. And uh, I have commented on that video as CD Baby. And oh, it was awesome. very <laughs> And it was a very kind of mixed response. Like lots of people were like, I love CD Baby. This is so awesome. Like you, yeah. did, you guys did the CDs for like my high school choir or, or something like that. Yeah. Or like, I love your distribution. And then other people being like, you are the problem. You know, yeah, uh, I love that. <laughs> um, I have a question about his uh, how he releases music. Is that format sort of his priority? It's like sort of a standalone, like one minute funny video, or is he distributing those songs to Spotify and elsewhere? He is distributing them uh, to Spotify and elsewhere, along with uh, his other also comedic uh, songs. But these ones that are doing really well on social are also being released uh, as standalone. Uh, singles as well. I liked what you said about like serialized content for a couple reasons. One, it's like you said, it provides that instant recognizability. So people are kind of drawn in when they've already responded to stuff previously. But also I feel like when artists commit to a, a vibe or a mode or something like it puts them on a schedule in a way. So like as they're getting engagement on social there's always something in the works to come out kind of somewhat regularly to, to capture the attention they're garnering through kind of previous activity, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. And I feel like if people don't commit to a series or an ongoing thing in that way, social tends to be way more like I'll post whenever I have something to say. And then who knows when that is. Right. And, And you can kind of, because of the landscape that we're living in, which frankly it sucks, but like if you are not, posting for you know weeks at a time you're trying to kind of jump back in the algorithm is not going to favor what you're doing which again sucks but if you can find something that is like you know repeatable a mold and and say I can do this again and just like change it up, up a little bit have a new subject matter then ideally it's easier to create more stuff more quickly with less thought we just recorded an entire episode about 10,000 ideas to communicate without social. So uh this is a great balance. Though. Yeah, right. <laughs> because it is still a very necessary tool. Like you said, unfortunately, that's just the way marketing is. This is where it is. Um, so how can we best utilize it? And yeah, I think this is a really interesting way to still make like engaging content, but it's also making art, you know, about it. I loved that it, he's making art about the irony of this thing that's sort of controlling art. (laughs) So it's beautiful. Yeah. I love that. It's also not based on a trend as well. He's just, he's making his own thing and it is repeatable, but it's not a trend unless someone decides to, you know, steal that whole animation video editing style. Then, then he is a trendsetter. He's doing well without having to do that. (laughs) Yeah. There's like part of the comedy for me is, and I'll describe it for listeners who, who didn't see the video, but you see on screen, he's designed these YouTube thumbnail type things for other mm-hmm. for books, for movie posters or whatever. And there's this slow addition of these caveats that you'd see in a YouTube thing, like um, where you, the closer you get to what the content actually is, the more you feel ripped off in a way, uh, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> but that reminded me of some of those tips that the Winborn group was recommending that there's so much happening on screen that to get the whole humor, like I'd probably have to watch that video five different times because it's happened so fast. Yeah. And apologies to those that are just listening, but definitely a recommendation to go check out our YouTube and watch this video or 
check out this artist directly because definitely worth the visuals. It's sort of hard to pick it up without <laughs> the visuals. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Cool. Well, um, thanks for doing this, Rachel. Do you have any um, any uh, hints as to what the next thing we'll be looking at is in a month or so? Uh, I will. Uh, so this is an artist. Today was an artist that was kind of more widespread. I might kind of tap into some uh, more local folks that I know that are just making cool stuff that really speaks to their personality and and lets them, you know, say who they are. Uh, without trying to necessarily go viral, but to uh, just speak to their audience and uh, keep that connection really strong uh, in a way that I just love. So we'll, well, yeah, we'll see for next time. Cool. I feel like I feel like our listeners will definitely respond to that. So thanks, thanks for doing this. Um, I guess that's it. Well, I've said thanks to Rachel like three times. Thanks again, and. Um, now we have to wrap up this episode in a really um, pithy yeah. way. Chris and I have been really trying to figure out a new tag, you know, a new way to say goodbye. Um, and we haven't quite figured it out yet. So I think what we're going to do is just say a bunch of different ways to say goodbye. And maybe one will stick. <laughs> I'll feed the same. Oh, that was what I was going to say. <laughs> goodbye. It's been great. Bye. Goodbye. And that's how the melon scrambles. That's a wrap. Love to see ya. Ta-ta. It's been great knowing you. Cut. Ta-ta for now. You've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. Broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 